Thank you for surviving the most hated thing. Um, but for those of you who are new or not new, those who have been along here a lot, that's a no-brainer, right? That's an easy thing to do. But if you are here for the very first time, or maybe second time or third time, uh, thank you for surviving that. Hopefully you got to know someone, and it made a difference, and it matters, and you go, okay, I'm not so uh, anonymous here anymore. Now, I am a little curious. Did anybody have a time or a place that was a rather strange one? Uh, and you don't have to decide it was strange. The other people will decide for you. Um, <laughs> did anybody have anything, a time or place? You're like, okay. Frederick Murph, if I had one. Murph, what, what did you say, man? Several, actually. <laughs> Mine was medieval. I just love that. Medieval times. Jousting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Horseback. When the men were men. When the men. <laughs> <laughs> and so were the women. <laughs> so... <laughs> 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 no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, let's go on. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes Bonnie a princess, and we all agree with that, right? <laughs> all right, anybody got any other? <laughs> dare I go to one other strange one? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, okay. That would have been cool before the Europeans got here. It would have been really fascinating to see this, to see this land and where it was. At. I'm in the middle of reading a book called uh, Empire of the Summer Moon. It's about the uh, Comanche uh, em em Empire, basically, that existed in the Texas area and uh, really beyond that. It's fascinating, powerful book about this Indian tribe and what happened to it. So, okay, yeah, I agree with that. All right, well, so on, enough. Uh, you guys, we're in the middle of a, uh, or really we're kind of reaching the end of a series um, called Ask Anything and Everything, and we basically um, solicited a bunch of questions from y'all, um, and I haven't been in the South, but it seemed appropriate, y'all, and um, uh, Ask Anything and Everything. Uh, and so uh, we've been in a variety of places, but we want to remind you that asking questions, we think, is a sign of wisdom. There's no, nothing wrong with asking questions and considering why, what, what's going on here. Uh, we want to give answers that have several different aspects to them that satisfy your head and your heart. We want to also talk about uh, it's something that's grounded in the truth. We also want to make sure that it doesn't miss having grace in it. Uh, today's question won't need grace as much. It's one of those that's a little easier in that way. Uh, but, uh, but we also want to admit that we may not understand it all. And so we'll do the best we can. Uh, here are some of, the, if for those of you new people, um, here's some of that we've addressed, addressed recently. On the 25th, we talked about what's the unpardonable sin all about. Uh, the following week, we did, how do you know that Jesus really was resurrected? How do we know that historically? How can we rely on that? And the fact that it really does matter, uh, rather than, well, that's a cool story. Maybe it even happened, but who, who cares? Uh, we, we wanted to say this is the difference it makes. Uh, also on February 8th, then, we talked about what's the deal with prayer and uh, does it matter, and how does it work? Um, then we tried to talk about, on the 15th, the role of confession and repentance and contrition or being broken by our own broken lives uh, and what's forgiveness all about. Uh, then on the 22nd, we, we wanted to talk about how can, oh, what can I do to be happy when it seems so elusive? Uh, we talked about that. Then uh, last week, uh, it snowed. I don't know if you remember, but it snowed, and Rockwood decided we, we ought not to meet, which is totally uh, appropriate. Uh, and so it feels like it has been a month since we've been together. So uh, I'm glad to be back together. But today what I want to do is I want to address the question of, uh, did God create time? Did God create time? This was asked by one of our elementary school kids, um, thinking at a level that I didn't think about until this past week. And, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I want to put this in a context, just for a second. Uh, we... Um, this past week, uh, I went to a conference of the Central District called Dangerous Calling. It's our Central District Convention, if you will, every year. Uh, and just so you know, we were voted in as a church, a member church of the Free Church. So <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, you know, all that work for a piece of paper that's out there on a, you can see it out there. But uh, no, really, it's an incredible group of people. Now, the speakers were supposed to be a guy named Paul Tripp, who is one of the top uh, kind of a counselor, kind of angled guys. 
smart, intelligent, wonderful guy. He couldn't come because he's in the middle of a very serious physical ail ailment. I think his kidneys are failing. Uh, so we really need to pray for him. And then the night before the conference, General Jerry Boykin, who was supposed to come, he's the guy who was in charge of uh, uh, Black Hawk Down. He was also in charge of when we sent uh, helicopters in to try to get the 53 uh, guys out of Iran way back when. He's in charge of a lot of really cool things. Well, he got snowed in, iced in in Washington, D.C. and couldn't come. And so at the last moment, what they did is they had these two guys come speak. David Dockery, who is the president, new president of Trinity International University, uh, and uh, Dr. John Woodbridge, who is a professor of church history and the history of Christian thought at uh, the seminary, at Trinity Evangelical uh, 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 Seminary, and uh, Divinity School, they call it. And uh, it was, uh, and it really, you know, I don't know if you look at them, but these guys are academians. Uh, they're very much academians. And so even Dr. Wil Woodbridge, he stood at the podium and he read his talks to us. And it was absolutely brilliant. It was stunning. And I just at times thought, are you kidding? That is so great. Uh, let me give you some of the talks that they gave us. Um, one was called The Secularization, Polarization, and Privatization of American Religious Life and Thought. Um, um, another is the... Cognitive contamination and the loss of historical memory. And the last talk that they gave was the loss of plausibility structures. And you got to go, okay, that's going to be a yawner, you know? And uh, <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? You guys, it was so rich to have these guys who have thought through this carefully and long and deep in their lives and not just thought about it on an academic level, but thought about it on a personal level and thought about it on a relationship with Christ and you tell you guys, these really love Christ. They love him deeply. Uh, Dr. Woodbridge has taught church history at TEDS for 50 years. I'm like, are you kidding me? And the guy was funny, but he wasn't animated. He wasn't doing jumping jacks in front. Uh, he wasn't running down up and down the aisles like I tend to do. Uh, but he was so bright and so well thought out um, that these issues were, he really made them real. Uh, we'll try to bring some of that uh, to bear even as we go along. In fact, Dr. Dockery would say that the number one thing in the face of every church in America today is the issue, issue of the sexual revolution that's happening in our midst. <laughs> it is the largest problem, largest challenge that we have. Um, on one level, I absolutely agree with him. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the reasons we've decided to address this uh, issue of sexuality. We'd already decided, but it was kind of confirmed. So... So, so well, let's go back to today. Uh, today we want to address the issue of did God create time? Uh, now, on one level, the answer is very simple. The answer is yes, he did. Uh, and so really what we have to do is then and maybe change the question just a little bit for today is we want to change it to this. What is the nature and the purpose of time? And not just time, but when to, to put it in this in the context for to be more relevant for today is, is and space also, the issue of time and space. Now, here's the deal. It is a question that's been wrestled uh, with both uh, philosophically and scientifically, this issue of space and time. Uh, what is it all about? How does it, why does it exist? Um, in fact, let me just say, for, for example, in the midst of the theory of relativity, uh, where time and space is not distinct from one another, they become, Im that's kind of what happens inside this theory of relativity. Uh, and trying to figure out where does all of that go. For example, I did a lot of reading this past couple of weeks about this. Uh, and so we, even when you get into space, and if you take space and time and put them together, uh, there is this uh, really wrestling with what's out there and why is it out there, uh, and how does time and space, does it matter to me? Or maybe it's external to me, and I'm something else. Or maybe it's so profoundly personal, for example, the black hole. Uh, holes in the universe, as they struggle with that. And to somehow in this black hole where there's maybe the disintegration of a star that turns into a black hole and it sucks everything into that, that maybe even that black hole is so strong that it sucks light itself into that hole. And then you begin to, begin to think, what, ex what exists in that black hole? Where does it go? Does it go into nothingness and therefore there's no such thing as time and space through that black hole? Or in that black hole, does maybe it suck everything in and it sucks you right into another universe? 
Or in that black hole, does it suck you right out and then back in another spot in the universe in which we know it? And so they're really wrestling with how does this issue of time and space relate to us? Uh, probably one of the other issues kind of related to that then is cosmology, which is the Greek word for cosmos, which is world, and uh, the word uh, logia, which means study of. And so it is the study of the origin, evolution, and eventual fate of the universe. Where is it going? Is it going to get sucked into a black hole? And where does it go from there? Uh, what's that thing all about? So they're pretty real, real issues. In fact, they're so real. Look at this. Uh, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, uh, who are two very accomplished scientists, uh, wrote a book together several years ago called The Nature of Space and Time. Uh, it's a debate between them. And in fact, it, it says here, it's a debate. This is one of the commentators on the book. It's a debate concerning the ultimate quest to combine quantum mechanics and relativity and how differently these two men have labored to comprehend, look at this, to comprehend what seems to be incomprehensible. They're trying to really wrestle with these issues and understand them uh, of this issue of space and time. Well, I think those are important. Let's go back to cosmology here. Um, if it's really understanding the origin, evolution, and fate of the universe, uh, I think here's the, the bottom line for me because I struggled with these things, that there has to be a perfect integration of both philosophical and scientific truth. There has to be. If God is, a, is, is really God, then there has to be a reality of the integration of the, both the philosophical and scientific truth that we have to struggle with. Because he is not a God who is out of control or a God who is a fake, He's got to be a God who's in charge of all of that. And there has to be an integration of it in space and time. Uh, let me just change the last two words. Maybe it helps us a little bit. It has to be a perfect integration of both the immaterial and material truths in this issue of space and time. Well, either that or God's just some sort of a mythological figure that kind of exists outside of truth. And that can't be right or else he's not God at all. So it seems to me we come down with this question of space and time. We come down to, do they confine, do space and time confine our experience or do they define our experience? I, and there's a lot of people, I think, struggling with saying that space and time might confine it. If, it's, if I don't know how to define it, I don't know where it comes from. And so what if I could escape space and time? What if I could get beyond it? What if it didn't define me? Or is it really one of those defining dimensions? Well, let's change the question just a little bit. Maybe is it, do they restrict our experience or do they enrich our experience, this issue of space and time? What if I could escape it? This, this world and the time in which I live or the, the sequence of events, what if I could escape it? Because sometimes living inside of space and time is a painful experience. Sometimes it's, it feels inadequate. And there are people who will want to try to escape that on one level or another. And so we have to decide, does it restrict us or does it enrich us? And here's, here's where I'm going to come from this morning. I think biblically speaking, that space and time define and enrich our experience by the design of God himself, who created both out of nothing and will be definitive for the rest of eternity that there will be space and time for the rest of eternity. And so it's the context in which he puts us. Now, the space will change. Someday it says that this world's going to go away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But there will still be a spatial reality. And there will still be time, though will be, there will be no end to time. Eternity will exist, but there is still a sequence. So here's what I want to do. Is I want to look even at, at this and the issue of time. Look at, look at Gen Genesis chapter 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's kind of a large general statement. Okay, now look at verse 2. And the earth was without void, was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now here's the deal that before creation, there was no such thing as space and time. God existed outside of that. He didn't need space and time to define who he was. That in the, in the Godhead, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are eternal, who have always been, are, and will always be, that they existed outside of space and time. And that was fine with them. They have no problem with it. 
They, because they are self-sufficient in themselves, the Godhead. But when God decided to create the world, he created space and time. So here it says, the earth was without form and it was void. There was nothingness. Now look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. You, you see that? He created time sequence. Evening, morning, there's a sequence of time God created. Wow, I think that's incredible. So here's the thing. The first thing that God created in all of creation was time itself, expressed by the light of day and the darkness of night. Now, let me just give it, give a small definition here. It is the linear and sequential dimension of our lives that in large part defines our reality. There is a sequence to it, right? There is a linearness to it. There is, it the Bible says that there, it was appointed once for man to be born, then to die, and then comes judgment. It is linear and sequential in nature. Uh, li life, though it has some cyclical dimensions, is not just a cycle of reincarnation coming back again and again and again. It's a one-time deal, and it's linear in its nature, and, it ha and it's sequential in its nature. It's the dimension into which God created us. Uh, and so taking it seriously, embracing it, understanding it is a part of life, that it has a sequence. And what's going on right now will not be exactly the same thing of what might develop in the days, weeks, months, years to come. Now, I don't know about you, but in some ways that gives me hope. I don't know about you, but sometimes what's going on right now in my life, I hope has some change <coughs> and some development. Maybe some redemptiveness. So that in this linear and sequential dimension, this is where God put me, uh, my reality. So let, let's throw this to the top of the screen. Um, and then let's make it smaller so we can add some things here. Here's what it is. Time, the linear and sequential dimension of our lives that is in large part defines our reality. So let me just give you a couple of passages to think about. Exodus chapter 9, it says, And the Lord set a time saying tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land, and the next day the Lord did this thing. He sets a time. Now, this was during the time in Egypt when, they, when, Pharaoh, when uh, Moses was saying, hey, Pharaoh, we're going to leave. Pharaoh said, no, you're not. And he said, well, you know what? When God sets a time, he sets a time. And he's, some of the plagues that happened, it says God set a time. And it happened. That God sets a time for us. Inside this thing called time and space, he sets times in our lives and what he's going to do, and he follows through. Look at this in Ecclesiastes, famous passage. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. You guys, let's keep going. It says there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. There's a time to plant. And there is a time to pluck up what is planted. There is a time to kill, and there is a time to heal. There is a time to break down, and there is a time to build up. There is a time to weep, and there is a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn, and a time to dance. There is a time to cast away stones, and there is a time to gather stones together. There is a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time to seek, and a time to lose. There is a time to keep silence, and there's a time to speak, there's a time to love, and a time to hate. There is a time for war, and there's a time for peace. There is a time for everything under heaven. It's interesting. There is a time. God has set a time in our lives. Wow. Well, look at this at the end of that whole verse. What gain has the worker from his toil? It's a great question. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Wow. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God has set eternity in our hearts that there is a time for each of these things. We don't know exactly when or how God is unfolding everything, but he has given us a time. Time is an important part of life. Wow. Look at this in Ecclesiastes a little longer. He says this a little farther into the book. He says, again, I saw that under the sun... The race is not to the swift. I like this passage. It's not to the swift. Nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. 
But time and chance, and not chance uh, like good luck, is to God's providential work is really what it's talking about. But time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, like the birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. That uh, we do not know exactly our time, but there are times where things happen. Have you ever had a timing in your head for what life was supposed to look like? How many people have ever had a timing? You had a picture and a timing? How many people? Really? Okay, all your hands should be up because I know you do. Okay, how many people, it has happened exactly like you thought it was going to happen? Let me see your hand. Okay, okay, nobody, I got it. Okay, how many, that, that, that tension between what you had pictured and what has happened, how many are bothered by that? Yeah, me too. It bugs me. God, I had a different idea. I had something better in plan. He goes, Kevin, I've, I've got a time for you. I'm doing something. It's not what you thought. Wow. Look at this in Psalm 31. It says, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. Now look at this. Here's the thought. My times are in your hand. Right? We wanted it to be in our hands. The timing of this whole thing. I wanted it. I want to control it. He says, no. The author here says, my times are in your hand, God. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. God, okay, this isn't working out like I intended. I'll trust you. My times are in your hand. Because this time, this sequential unfolding of life is in your hands. It matters. Wow. Look at this in Galatians 4.4. 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, had come, God sent forth his son. At this unique time in all of human history, in the fullness of it all, he sent his son at the right time, in the right place, at the right time. You know, Jesus Christ Superstar, the, the famous Broadway show. You know, why did you send him at such a strange time in such a backward land? What were you thinking, God? You're, are you out of your mind? And he goes, I know it looks like that, but I'm not. I knew exactly what I was doing in the fullness of time. Wow. Look at this in Ephesians. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, that he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God is in charge of timing. In this thing that he's put us in, in the midst of this sequential unfolding of life, by, by his design, by his desire. Look at Colossians 4. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time that you have. And we never know exactly, do we, how much more time we've got. Um, you never know. A good friend of ours in California, his name was Bill, and Bill's my age. This is 10 years ago. He and his wife were walking out of the front door of their house, headed for the car to go out and go and work out. And he dropped on the spot of a heart attack and died right there. It's like, whoa, you never know. Uh, I know if you saw in the paper this week there, I think it was the oldest woman in the world in Japan. She's 117 this past week. Um, you know, that's a lot of years beyond where I'm at. I mean, you know, that's a lot of years. I mean, I might have a long time. I may get to 118 and drive everyone crazy, you know, and um, it, it, you never know. But he says, but make the use of the time that you do have and let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Wow, that's right. Look at Psalm 62. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is, in, is from him. For on, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times. At every moment in this sequential thing called life, to trust him at all times. Oh, people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. That he can, at every moment of this thing called life, all of its highs and all of its lows, and most of it's on the flat plains of boredom, right? That's most of life, to trust him at all times in all of that whole thing. Look at this in Psalm 49. Why should I fear 
in trouble, times of trouble. Anybody been there? You've all been there. And we'll all be back there. That's what I hate about this thing. We'll all be back there again. But when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, with those who, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. Who should I fear? Why should I fear in times of trouble? God has me in every time of trouble. So look at Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together at all times. Wow. This thing called life, this sequential unfolding of events matters in our lives. Well, let's just wrap it up with, with, with suggesting this. Time is the context in which we live. This is where God put us. It is a gift from God, and he uses it in our lives and that we are to be stewards of as we invest in that which will last for eternity. That what we, how we use our time matters. And there are times where it's really great, and there are times where it's horrible, and there are a lot of times in between, but all of them matter. That in the fullness of time, God is working. It is our context of life. And it's developmental and it's sequential. And it matters. Wow. So all of a sudden, who made time really matters, right? Because it's the context in which God put us. Okay, now, let's just quickly, this won't be as long, but let's talk about the second thing that God created was space. It's expressed by the formation of earth and the creation of man and his image. Look at this. It is the three-dimensional environment in which object, object, objects and events have relative position or direction. I know that sounds really academic, but think about it. It's this, this environment where everything matters, where it's put. And he did it for us. So you live in Missouri for a purpose. Now, I don't know if you know, but the, the beaches here are not that great. <laughs> you know, they're not. You go to California, you can find far better beaches. You can go to Florida, and the beaches are better than they are here, just so you know. Um, the mountains here are not like the Rockies. Um, but there are some things here that God has done at this place, this place called Missouri, Illinois, whatever it is, that are amazingly beautiful. And, and, for, and he made this place for you and I to be, to have our being right now, to live it out. It's incredible what he's done. Now, let's just finish this. Now, Emmanuel Kant said this, um, part of an unavoidable systematic framework for organizing our experience. You see, God gave us a place to organize our experience. It's called time and space, this place in which we live. So you could almost put it this way. It is the gift of God that gives us an environment in which we can organize and understand God's work in and through our lives. He wants to do it right now in this place called St. Louis, Missouri or Clarkson Valley, or wherever we are, right here in this place. Wow, he gave it to us. So let's put that the definition up at the top of the screen, and let's just look at this. Look at creation, you guys. After he made time in Genesis, then he created the outer space, or the heavens, on the next day, on day two. Then he created the land and the sea and the vegetation on day three. He began creating this space for us. Look at day four, he, the creation of the sun and the moon. He created light and darkness on day one. He didn't create the sun and the moon until day four. Interesting enough. Creation of the, of the sea life and the birds on day five. And then on day six, he created the land mammals. And then he created you and me. He created Adam and Eve. He created in his image that which for the very first time in all of creation was called very good. Everything else was good. And then he created mankind. You know what I think happened in heaven is, is that they were going along and the angels, the angelic world that already existed, they were watching this unfold and they're like, wow, that's incredible. Look what he just did. Wow, can't wait to see tomorrow. And, and they're like following this thing along. And then on day six, they're going, that's cool. I like that horse, you know? Okay, look at that strange thing he just made called a hyena. I mean, I mean and then all of a sudden, 
He made mankind, and they went this, like this. They went, his image. Created in his image. Everything changed. Creation just took a whole new another level. He made man and woman in his own image, image bearer. And the whole universe gasped to watch what would happen. In space and in time, he created us. So here's the deal. I want to wrap this up. The nature of space and time. They are gifts from God that give us context and understanding of life itself as God unveils and reveals his handiwork and his redemptive plan for you and for me. So I, I think we just kind of get used to living life, spending time, existing in the space in which we exist, and we forget that they're a gift. We forget that God made us, and he's using it, this time and space, to help form us into who we are. Whatever the time and space that you have in life right now, whatever that is, you see, here's maybe the, the bottom line thought. The time and space are the dimensions of life in which he, his plans unfold. He's using it. So let's ask the question. So therefore, what do we do? I love this clip. It comes from Gladiator. I don't agree with every theological piece of this. <laughs> but at the end, it is right. Listen to Maximus. What we do in life echoes in eternity. It's a true statement. Now, we won't unleash hell. We're trying to unleash exactly the opposite. <laughs> okay. But what we do in life echoes in eternity. See, God created us to live in space and time. We will for, the, for eternity. And what we do today matters. What we do with time in the space in which he's given us totally matters. So we go back to the question, did God create time? The answer is yes. What's the nature of it? It is the very context that God uses to help us live and to live it fully, to not try to escape it or push it aside, but to embrace it and to live it well to live fully in the midst of the space and time that he's given us. It's a gift. It's an incredible gift. And so this next week, I, my encouragement to all of us is that we would embrace the time and space in which we live and not try to get ahead of it. For God is right on time every moment. Right? That God is right on time. He's never behind. You wish sometimes he'd show up earlier. Do it differently, but he's right on time. God is always on time in your life, and you can trust him with it. And the space in which he puts you to live your life with fullness as to who he is and what's he's, what he's doing. And that makes this, work, this week worth living because he'll be there in the midst of every moment. That's my encouragement for us, to be people who would live it fully this week. Next week's not guaranteed to any of us. So let's live this one to the fullness of what he created us for. Let's pray. Father, I'm really grateful for the young man down in Quest Kids who asked this really important question. And for this question that's being debated and wrestled with at the highest levels of the scientific world, at the highest levels of the philosophical world. And Father, we know the reality is that you are the author of every philosophical truth and every scientific and material truth of the world. And I don't understand all of it, but I also know that you put me in this time and this place. And you put each one of us in this time and this place in order to live and to live well. In the midst of the troubles, we'll give you our praises. In the midst of the difficulties, we will recognize your sovereignty. In the midst of our disappointments, we acknowledge the fact that your, your, who you are in your person 
gives us hope. And so, Father, we do pray that this coming week we would live inside this gift that you've given us of time and space, and we would live it well, and we would live it in the power of your Spirit, and that we would give ourselves to the things that you have appointed for us in this time, in this particular week. May we live it well. God, may we honor you and love you and enjoy your incredible love for us. And these things we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.